Um, welcome everyone. It's um, my honor tonight to welcome Tatiana Bilbao to make our lecture series um, really international tonight. Um, it's kind of first guest this year from overseas um, and I think probably first, uh, first guest for a long time uh, from the kind of southern Americas. Um, yeah, I'm very proud to have Tatiana here tonight. I first um, came across her work, uh, shame on me, not too long ago. I think it was in 2008 when I met uh, my kind of longtime friend back then in Venice, um, David, who you also met uh, a couple of weeks ago back at the jury, um, who just um, went to Mexico a year before that. Um, and soon after uh, became um, associate, uh, associate at uh, Tatiana's. And uh, he was in Venice to set up the, um, um, the contribution the office made uh, to the uh, Venice Biennale. And what um, kind of David then, then told me in these days we, we spent uh, setting up uh, exhibition and this stuff, uh, was really intriguing uh, about the office that there, there is a uh, a practice in Mexico City which is really kind of devoted to local world but also uh, spans out internationally and spans out internationally um, not only to get work what kind of architects usually do but also to kind of reach out to artists and reach out uh, to other architects as well so kind of truly collaborative um, office um, with a kind of driving force and kind of search for kind of novel collaborations. Um, and that coming from yeah, a place like, like Mexico um, and really seeing that, that it's all done on the basis of projects. Um, kind of from the European ex perspective, uh, it's often kind of done on uh, kind of collaboration as, um, as the main driver and then everyone is waiting for, for projects like uh, with Tatiana's it's mostly done through projects where then people just come together and, and realize it. Um, that was really something uh, inspiring and um, since then I'm, I'm following the work and I'm, I'm happy that we kind of got the opportunity here since um, Tatiana is a visiting professor this year at the uh, Fachschule in Düsseldorf. Uh, they have a really good um, visiting professors program. So she's there for this semester, which made it even easier for us to kind of um, have her a, have a in here tonight. Um, to uh, to Tatiana's background, just quickly um, an introduction that um, you studied at, um, in Mexico at the Universidad Ibericana. Uh, graduated in 1996 and uh, soon after became an advisor for the um, Housing and uh, Urban Development Department of Mexico City, uh, which kind of initiated a kind of really uh, an architectural work that is rooted in the, in the urban. And uh, soon after founded the first office, uh, LCM, with uh, Fernando Romero, who is also a kind of name as he kind of was uh, kind of, let's say, a protege of OMAs at some point. Um, and um, then in the early 2000, 2004, set up her own office um, with work that was already kind of, I think first project was in China and France, so already establishing an international practice uh, on, the, on the first projects. Um, and then the kind of most important projects, the um, kind of uh, regeneration of the botanical gardens in, uh, in Mexico City, which involved a whole collaboration of, uh, of artists such as Saint, uh, James Terrell, uh, Olaf Fuelis, and uh, Dan Graham, and many others. I'm sure we'll uh, kind of see some of that, hopefully. Um, and then um, also, kind of what I mentioned, inviting other architects to participate in a big master plan project along a pilgrim route in the northern part of, of Mexico. Um, and they're kind of inviting a couple of uh, Swiss architects, which uh, Tatiana is really close with, close with 
Um, and I think that is really a kind of good uh, role model to see that uh, architects can actually work together, not only um, can f compete so hardly. There's always competition, uh, but that competition could be really fruitful. I'm very looking forward to see your lecture tonight. Please welcome Tatiana Bulba. Thank you, Miko. Thank you, Johan, for inviting me here. I'm very, very glad to be here tonight with you. Um, I hope that uh, at the end of the lecture you're not disappointed for what I'm going to say. I was going to say Johan, but I hope not. Uh, the context, uh, I wanted to, to tell you a little bit about uh, the story of how uh, our architecture has developed and how the context that we work on has um, really uh, affected what we do. So um, I, I will tell, uh, I will go through the project as if it was a story and how it, it uh, one thing led to another. Uh, they asked me to give a title to the lecture, so the title that I gave was The Way Things Go for the um, so-claimed uh, work of art, Fishley and Weiss, the Swiss architect, artist did um, a uh, very long time ago, uh, in the 70s, uh, as this video that uh, it's, you might have seen it, of a um, series of events that are perfectly planned, but they seem kind of uh, accidental, where, for example, a flam, a flam lights and then a, 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 a round thing goes down, a little path they put and it crashes to another thing, then it turns around with another thing. I don't know if you have seen it, but if you, you can see it. Um, and I think that it's an um, incredible chain of events that, as I was telling you, it seems totally incidental, but it's perfectly planned. Not in my work, nothing is perfectly planned, but it's, it's really a series of events that seem very accidental, that have led one to another. And they're very different set, a set of events that complete a chain, you know? and I think it will still com be completed for forever. And uh, a year ago I was asked to do um, uh, the cover for Domus in June 2000. Uh, 12, exactly a year ago, it was uh, in the cover of Domus, and they asked me to do a cover that represented uh, the way we do design, and to explain a little bit in very few words what was uh, the way we do design, and exactly I thought of these, um, uh, uh, of represented through the through thinking on the video of, of on the work of Fishley and Weiss. Um, and I did this cover, and what we did, uh, I think it resumes a lot, and I probably, you don't understand it, you will not understand it now when I explain it, but you will understand, I hope you understand it by the end of the lecture. Uh, what we did is we did a, a, a cadaver ski, a ski, an exquisite cadaver, uh, I don't know how to translate that, uh, which is this drawing that uh, you do, uh, folding the page and passing the drawing to others. What we did is we asked uh, three different offices that we collaborate a lot with, which is Christian Gantenbein in Switzerland, HHF, Derek Delecamp in Mexico, HHF in Switzerland also, and us. And uh, at the top, we did it on the office, and every person from the office did one part of the, the drawing. Uh, so, uh, it also resumes my interest in collaborations. Uh, it resumes this process of uh, accidental things that come together into one thing, but it resumes also the collaboration uh, work that I, I really encourage and like to do in the office. You will uh, understand that a little bit further. Um, the first uh, I, the first project we did was this exhibition pavilion in China, and um, I started. I, I studied in a school that is very conservative, very traditional. I started using computers when I was in third year. Uh, although computers were already a very good tool for doing architecture, not as it, it is today. But um, I, I started learning how to draw plans uh, by hand. And so it was a very traditional architect uh, architecture and very traditional school. 
uh, but I, I was living in a, in a moment where globalization was really something very new but very important and every, every other young uh, uh, architect of course but every other young person wanted to be in this stream of globalization. No? Uh, so it was not different for me. So I started looking for the ways architecture was being done in other parts, how architecture was being taught in other parts of the world. And I started doing architecture uh, using uh, different algorithms to define geometry. And, uh, but I did start do doing that with very simple tools. And as you can see, the result is that it's kind of very brutalist because uh, to define these geometries, I never used the software. I never used um, real algorithms. I was only using kind of intuitive uh, forms or points to perform a geometry in a physical model. And uh, I was taught to do architecture with very simple materials, to build with very simple and um, raw materials because this is what we have in our surroundings, no? Materials such as concrete, uh, not even a lot of steel, not even wood, things that uh, are not so flexible, just the concrete, bricks, etc. So I was doing this type of architecture, trying to, to look for a more global point of view of architecture and doing uh, this type of uncharted geometries but with very simple tools. The result is these type of buildings that are kind of um, uh, trying to achieve its specialness or its uh, uh, main objectives through these techniques. Uh, one was this, uh, the exhibition room in China, which w our idea was, our main idea was that you discover the building in many different ways through the, through different places that you approach in order to exalt a little bit the, the, um, the senses and to relate a little bit to the Chinese culture that we were building with. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on that building because otherwise we're not going to end up anywhere. Uh, but this, the same way we did this uh, studio in Mexico, which is a studio for an artist. And uh, here, what, uh, the legacy that it was more important for the office was the understanding on how the, the concrete could be very flexible for our ideas. But we were still testing the idea of building this space through these uncharted geometries. And, um, but the, the way we, we, we managed to work with the contractor was really good because we were able to really understand the many conditions on, on what, how we work in Mexico. The guy that did this, is, it, it's all done in exposed white concrete and uh, he's an artisan so he was working with us in the site. Uh, exploring with the, with the material and with the forms that we're proposing. So this was uh, uh, really a start on something we, we finally achieved that I'm going to explain a little bit later. And at the end, um, uh, we, as I was telling you, what we got most of out of this design was uh, the use of the concrete and how to extend its limits within the restraints we have in the technology we have in Mexico. Um, in the same period, we designed this house, which was built uh, just recently finished, but we designed it in that period. And we, as we a little bit understood the conditions on what we could um, uh, extend the use of the concrete with the past uh, experience. And what we did is we used uh, an hexagon to start uh, the, the, to start the, the, the design. And we uh, decided like, to extend the form uh, or to alter the hexagon uh, with the um, constraints of the, of the terrain and of the, topogra well, the topography and, and, the, and the trees and the, in the site in order to achieve uh, one of the most um, important ideas the client had. The client wanted a, a one floor house in this site, so, which was kind of a little bit uh, ridiculous thinking, we thought. And what we decided to, to, to do is to break the house into very small spaces, well not very small spaces, small, the smallest space we could break the house in, which was like one room is one space, uh, one bathroom is one space, each program is one space, 
and uh, with that uh, accommodate each, each room uh, on top of the topography in order to achieve a slight um, uh, uh, difference of level between each space in order for them to make them that the house was almost in one level, which is not, it's almost in three levels, but you achieve the difference of level in, in, in between each of the spaces. So the, the sense of it, you don't uh, go more than three steps to one, from one room to the other one. So at the end you have this sensation that the, the house flows in one level, not of, obviously not in one, but uh, at least in what it can be achieved with the topography. Um, at the end, there's one connection that connects all the floors together, so you can go into a rapid connection through all the house, which is this main staircase. Uh, but as I was telling you, it wraps a bit around the trees and the topography, and it spans through the view with the different uh, spaces uh, achieving the different um, um, orientations and views. No? This house, as I was saying, was uh, designed in this period where we were trying to uh, achieve this um, idea of doing the defining the spaces through the um, uh, definition of uncharted geometries and how we could achieve it to to to, to do it in these conditions. No. This house, uh, then we did build this house, which is the house uh, we designed with the artist Gabriel Orozco. Gabriel Orozco, for those that you don't know it, is the most important Mexican artist, contemporary artist we have. By now, he is the one that defines like the history, the line between, in history, the line between uh, postmodern art and contemporary art. He's the one that set up the school, the contemporary art school in Mexico and he's the most acclaimed contemporary artist. He, the story is really funny, I'm gonna go through it very fast, but when we were very young, uh, just going out of school and having an office with, of course, no commissions, uh, what we did is we did a lot of competitions, open competitions, as many as we could, but we also decided to start designing things, uh, hypothetical things, for example, a house in the moon, because we thought maybe at this time we would be designing houses in the moon, and um, which probably we do very soon, I hope. And uh, we did a design for Gabriel Orozco, a house for Gabriel Orozco. We knew his work. Barely anyone knew it in Mexico. He was more working, he was based in Berlin and he was working in Europe. In, in Europe he was already an important artist, proposing important things. And uh, we decided to do a house for him. We never met him before. We, we only did the house based on what we read from his work. And uh, when we, d we, we had the design, we went and knocked on his door. We knew he was in Mexico for a short while. And he, he liked it. He liked the idea. He opened the door. He, he liked the idea. And we discussed with him three or four times about the house. Of course, as I was telling you, it's a hypothetical project that was never going to be realized and it never was realized but this is how we met him and like 10 years after or eight years after he arrived to my door knocking saying that then I need help with this project so uh, he arrived with the model already of um, observatory in India named the Jantar Mantar which is in Delhi uh, 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 one of the observatories that is in this Jantar Mantar and um, he wanted us to help him build this in this beautiful setting. Uh, so we were never the initiators of the idea. We were never the, 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 the ones who had the original idea of doing this project. We were only helping him building it, helping him transforming this structure, which was an original observatory, to a house and then building it. First we had a long discussion, which I'm not going to go through that, that I, I wanted to convince him not to do exactly the same structure, and then he convinced me that we were doing exactly the same structure. Uh, it was a very interesting process, but I think uh, other than very interesting process working with a mind like him, and, and of course an obsessive mind like him, for three years. The most important legacy that we uh, got from this process was 
working with the people that we work, uh, which was the, con the, the builders of this house. This house is in a, in a very little town named Roca Blanca in the north of Puerto Escondido, which is already a very little town from the Pacific coast of Mexico, uh, where there live probably 300 people. And these 300 people, they're non-educated at all, uh, meaning that most of them don't know how to read or write. Uh, so this is one of the most extreme conditions, of course, that we're going to find in Mexico. But in mainly and normally, this is the conditions of the people that work in construction business. The people that arrive to the cities and looking for a job, they go into construction. Uh, so in the construction business, we have people that is totally uneducated, but incredibly flexible, incredibly creative, incredibly open and eager to learn. So uh, these people were the ones that we really work with in this case. And our task was that, just to translate a specific design, a specific thing, and build it there. Gabriel wanted to, to hire the local people in order to start relating to the community, but also, of course, giving job to the community, which, it, which it was good for, for the economy and which was good for him, because then he would become part of the community as well. So. Um, we needed to translate not only an observatory into a house and not even this house into a, a built thing, but this uh, idea into this language of these people that didn't even uh, know how to read. Ne don't, don't talk about reading plans, no? So um, it was working with them. It, actually, we did the drawings for us, <laughs> mainly, because we had to work with them uh, on site a lot. But there is where I learned that uh, mainly, as I was telling you, probably this is the most extreme case that we will find in the way, but that this is the people that are building the things we are designing. And that it, if it's difficult enough to translate a structure that is very rational, like this one, which has incredibly rational geometries, it's a semicircle, semisphere, and, and cubes, which is th the simplest thing you can think. It was very difficult to translate it into their language. It was very difficult to build it. It was a really challenge to build it. Uh, when we built the the, um, the mold for the for the for the pool, it was a big story, and I think it's going to be the story that the people are going to tell to their children and grandchildren, and for many generations. Uh, so when I realized that, I thought that it was uh, really important to think what is the conditions of where, uh, where we're building and how uh, the people is going to build it in order to achieve the best architecture we could. So it really changed the way uh, we, are, we were working before, as I was telling you. And I, it also made me realize where am I, where, where I come from, and where I studied from, and how I did I study, and what are the skills I have personally uh, to build things. No? So uh, I think our architecture become more honest with our history, and become more honest with our, with our tools, with our surrounding, after building this house. This is the plans. Uh, of the house, very, as I was telling you, probably you could say it's very simple. It's the um, the the circle is where the spheres where the observation area was done in the observatory in India. Um, it has it had um, slices in between so the light could come in, and in the rooms the observation was done. Uh, right now the pool, so we we filled it. It is a pool, and then the rooms are the ones that are uh, used for. Uh, habitable spaces, no? And the terraces uh, make like the whole circle finally around. There are the toilets outside and like the uh, resting areas. Uh, this is a resting area, that's the dining area. Um, here, here's one of the toilets. Uh, the toilet, the, the, actually the water closet is underneath the stairs. The, the, the shower is outside, etc. So, um, of course, as I was telling you, one of the most uh, 
uh, important relevant things was to to realize this and in order to to differently work in the future no and to understand as i was telling you we are not a technological country so it's very difficult to un to try to think that you could do um, a, a construction with a technological material you would have to import the material you will have to import even the the hand labor because people don't know how to manage th these things we don't have the tools to 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 build the material, we don't have the tools to, to do it in the construction. So, um, uh, as I was telling you, I I learned architecture through this simpleness and roughness, and uh, I was trying to copy things that were uh, uneasy to do in our country. And so, with this, I realized that it would be much easier and less frustrating if we start thinking on this uh, uh, not uh, the other way around. No? So then we started to really do simple things and start to think in the easiest way of uh, strategies to start building, of course, then trying to make things more complex as we did in this house. Uh, for a project in China, which we started with the more stark typical form of a house we all have in mind. And then we started complexizing by taking away one module of each part. And uh, this way we defined the strategy on how we were going to uh, end up doing the house. Or this project in, um, in, uh, in the center of Mexico, which is a um, a spectacle center that we did the same strategy. The program is a spectacle center that uh, that needs a round uh, theater, like a Roman theater, in with this with the scenario in the center and the public around it. Uh, and we just add the program in this. Um, uh, in these circles around that encircle the, the, the scenario part. And our main idea was to do a building that could, not, uh, that could function uh, other than just for the spectacle, because this spectacle was going to happen probably two or three times a year. Uh, and we wanted to create a building that could uh, allow really different activities. So one is like uh, being an observation point. It's not uh, a tall building, but it's the tallest building around the area. So you could really make it an observation point. Uh, also, you could make it a, a, an open space to, to walk and to be. And what we did is we put the bars in there. Uh, there, there are two bars in one restaurant in relationship to the exterior, so you can enter also, you can use the bar and the, and the restaurants, the bars and the restaurant when you are not, uh, when the spectacle is not there. And also uh, the stores, for example. So uh, this is also something that we learned through the, through the um, um, building of Gabriel, that you, it is very important that you could use any excuse uh, in this case, any building that you are commissioned to do, to give a little bit more, to think on something else the building could do, because since this infrastructure is also very, we're short in infrastructure in, in Mexico, and there are few buildings that can uh, really give a lot of things, uh, that it is really necessary that you think in how this building can perform in many ways, no? Because it's really necessary in terms of working in an economy that is not so buoyant that, well, and I think it's responsible, it would, should happen everywhere, to, uh, to explore many, many possibilities of one different building. This, the, of course, the client didn't expect this. The client wanted a spectacle center point. And when we uh, started thinking on doing not just the spectacle center, that the spectacle center could be only an excuse to do a public space, then things started to change within the client also and started to, to flow very differently. Um, this is a, a, another building, another example of exactly what I'm saying, of a very simple strategy of using a simple geometry to work. This is a building uh, for a university, which um, I was surprised that I think you're working in a, in a program similar like this. It's an accelerator and incubator uh, that it's done for, uh, it, the client is the university, but the university, what they wanted, it was the, to start it, to create a link with the business and to start a platform that would link the students with the 
real businesses and uh, the, the companies that are doing different uh, projects and experiments in order to give a platform for the students to grow and to start linking them with the, with the real world, for us to say it and also to give a platform to the uh, businesses or the companies to develop project, projects with fresh and new um, uh, people that are the students. So what we were asked is, was for a building that could have a very open relationship in between its internal spaces, but also that it could have a very simple way and easy to rent them because they needed to bring the companies that are interested and they didn't know what spaces the companies would need at the end. So what we did is, and they already had a design, and uh, they, exp they told us that they explored different ways and that the rectangle was the most simplest way they could find the solution for. And we decided to keep on going on that and not to do any research and use a rectangle. And what we only did is we stacked this rectangle, making these uh, slight movements in each uh, to create the shadows necessary and the open spaces we wanted to create in each floor. Um, necessary for the building to function, no? And what we decided was to uh, create an area that could link the building to the, to the exterior with real program, not only uh, for private companies, but to more broad public, as I was telling you, trying to explode uh, the program a little bit more. And their uh, whole idea was to relate with this, with the world, right? So we said, well, start to relate with the city, because the, the, um, the, the, the university is totally enclosed in a gated community like this is the, how the universities in Mexico lie in the in the city uh, right now you can still see the fence but it's already being taken out this building is just finished and what we decided is okay let's bring the building to the city let's put it in in the city, let's take the, the, the gate out and let's put the gate behind so the building really connects with the city because otherwise your idea of connecting, yeah, it's a nice idea, but how it really happens, no? So we thought we convinced them, we needed to convince them to really quit the fence or at least put the fence back. Of course, it was impossible to convince them to quit the fence. This is part of their, stat, stat, their, their really important things they do in their campuses. But what we convinced him is that this building didn't need a fence. And we convinced him also to do a public space uh, uh, so the people can really use it. They, uh, there is an auditorium in the university which is only for the uh, use of the university, but we decided to create an auditorium here that was really for the public, that it's able to be rented by uh, the people in the city or the government or whoever to do things. It's needed for the city. Uh, they don't have any venues like this. And uh, I, the other, I think, strategy that we did is we uh, stacked all the floors um, parallel except for one, which that floor it holds the accelerator and incubator. And our idea was to also make this building look like an ingrain for the city, for the for the students and for the companies, uh, the external private companies that were going to be there. And that the, the floor that it's the engranage or that does that is exactly the one that it's flipped. And uh, so this is why we flipped that one and we accommodate uh, all the program of the accelerator and the incubator there. And this is why it also has a different finish. So as I was telling you, trying with simple uh, strategies to do a complex, of course, very complex building in terms of, uh, of programmatically speaking, but trying to make it as buildable as possible in the conditions we have. We also don't have uh, other two restraints and conditions we have, and we, we had them with Gabriel Orozco, is time and money. Uh, we Normally, like Gabriel arrived with the model and said, I want to start building tomorrow. Normally, it's not understood that the architecture needs time and needs a lot of uh, time to be created and then to be uh, 
put it into a plan, a set of plans, and then that the project has a time. Uh, we wish we could have like a year for a project. We don't. We normally in Mexico, really, people is used to that they start when they hire an architect is because they will start building tomorrow. So that also makes things a little bit uh, difficult if you start to, to, to do things very complex uh, in, in order to make plans. Uh, money, it's a big issue. Of course, as I was telling you, we don't have the technology available. So to bring technology to do different and explore different geometries would cost so much money uh, that it's always over budget. So um, this is also the, the things why we need to, to, to start do, using different strategies. And for me, it's amazing how, um, uh, for example, I was amazed last year that I was uh, awarded this Kunst Prize in Berlin, that um, someone in Germany that uh, really, in Germany, architecture depends on the final details, could really uh, look at our architecture. Because our architecture really doesn't depend on the details. It cannot depend on the details because, again, of the economy, and I will show an example of that. It needs to depend on the definition of the space and not on the final detailing of the, of the, of the building. Because then, uh, then if we would really rely our architecture in the final detailing of the building or the final uh, way of assembling the building, then our architecture, or we would be very frustrated, or it would fail. So we really need to think on strong spaces and how the definition of the space is in order to achieve, uh, I think, good architecture and good spaces in, um, other than thinking on the detailing. No? For example, this house is a 300 square meter house and the client arrived to our office saying that she, of course, wanted to start building tomorrow. This is the same, every, every other client does the same. And, uh, but the thing is that she had only 120,000 euros to build a house, which uh, in Mexico is um, a good budget if you didn't want it a 300 square meter house. Uh, and if you didn't want it like these spaces she wanted, she described a house, a very luxurious house. Uh, so it was already, it is not as low uh, the budget as it sounds here, 120,000 euros, but it's very low still. So we uh, understood that the, our main task was to find a solution on how we could uh, find uh, a material that could be as noble as to perform uh, within uh, uh, the, the, our idea of the project, but within the budget. So uh, we discarded a lot of materials and we arrived finally to compacted earth, which was the only material that we could use that allows us everything. That could be the definition, the final aesthetic definition, that could be the structure, that could be the isolation, that could be the, the, um, the main definition of the space, no? So we started looking into the material, we started understanding how the material worked, and then we started with the design. And what we did is a simple gesture of doing two squares that were facing the lake, the, in the south of the drawing, and in the south, you would, it, it, it is a lake, and in the north there is a mountain range. Uh, so we faced the two main spaces to the, to the lake, the, and we lift up the, the, the roof of the main space to the, to the lake and the roof of the private space to the mountains, creating, uh, of course, a double height in the, public, in the public space and a, a double height in the private space that became a studio. The rest then needs two other um, um, squares intersected that they, create, they are like the, the service area. And uh, as you can see, the spaces, of course, are very rough and very simple and very raw. And it all comes, again, to the, to the fine line of the very tight budget we had. Uh, the furniture we didn't decide. It was uh, her introduction into the design. And um, uh, the, so, uh, as I was telling you, we built this house with compacted earth. Uh, the only structure is compacted earth point uh, all the time. You will see these uh, two columns, for example, and one in the exterior that are 
um, uh, in reality they are the, the, the water drainage for the, for the roof. So, uh, so we, we cannot, of course, in the compacted dirt you cannot introduce any other installation in between, but I'm not going to go through the technical details, we can talk if someone wants more details afterwards. But uh, as I was telling you, we, uh, we wanted to have a material that could allow us to do the architecture we like to do, which is, as I was telling you first, having a thing that could allow us to def define the space as a strong space, and, but also it's at the end beautiful and, and, and responsible with the budget and with the site. No? So the compacted earth, we used the earth in this, in, not exactly in the site because that was too humid, it's very near to the lake, but in the back side of the near the, where the mountain hill starts, it's 100 meters from the house, uh, there's a bank of earth, so we brought the earth from there and we were able to do this 300 square meter house with the characteristics the client wanted with the budget she was able to afford. No? Um, then uh, uh, another project uh, with a special characteristics that we did that explain a lot how we work in Mexico is this funeral house. Um, the program is really uh, strange, funeral house. Uh, well, I never imagined I was going to do a funeral house. And I will explain later what that meant. But I think the, the relevance and the importance of this project is that uh, we understood since the first moment, as in the other house we understood that the main problem was the, the, the budget issue. In this one we understood that the clients were never going to hire a building company, a construction company. They were going to hire uh, a guy that was helping them painting their other funeral houses because they own a big company and they have many several funeral houses. Literally the guy that coordinating the, the maintenance they needed, like the painting and the fixing of the plumbing of a, of a bathroom, like this, and he was going to be the head of the construction. This they told us since the beginning. So we knew that the construction quality was going to be zero, less than zero. So we knew that we needed to work with it in order to, and, and started thinking our design with these constraints. Uh, in order to achieve something good. So what we wanted, um, then we started imagining how we do a funeral house, no? And then we started thinking, uh, if we, um, we started thinking on death, and we took, it took months for us to start in these philosophical dis the discussions about death. And then we realized a funeral house is more a social, um, Reun um, a social uh, meeting point uh, and we needed to think not on the death but on the living on the living that we're grieving of course it's a social meeting point not for parties but uh, it's a social meeting point and that's what it is at the end and it's a transitional space it's a transitional space for everybody because it's uh, a place where uh, a person could only go there for three days probably in his life and point. Funerals in Mexico last two or three days. Uh, what they, the ritual is normally is they have the body and they are around the body grieving and having masses or anything for 48 to 72 hours depending on, on, the, con, uh, on the, and the family, what they decide. Um, and to wait for the people that come and, and grieve with you and greet them and they greet you also. So we thought of, uh, we started thinking on this place as that, as a social meeting point that is transitional, transitional and it's for the living. It's for the living grieving for the death, but it's for the living because the death is not their final destiny. This is not a, a cemetery and it's, uh, at the end it has some niches this is the, the program that they added after the design was done. But it's not the final resting places for, for the death, no? It's a transitional space. So uh, what we decided is we wanted to create a space that could um, um, uh, introduce nature into it. This uh, area in Mexico is very desertic and the city is very uh, empty, uh, like only very urban and without many 
vegetation and the site had a lot of vegetation was a beautiful garden so we decided why well, let's need, need let's keep the garden and try to introduce it so what we did is we proposed the five chapels they were asking their name chapels but is there like like the the places where the 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 funeral is taking place uh, five chapels uh, and place them around the hall that could be uh, the the meeting point but could be also the point where nature meets architecture and uh, of course that where the point where um, it could be more how to say dramatic in terms of uh, light managing of light and space so you could also exalt the the feelings of the people there and help them probably to or to leave them there or to just not go worse than what you enter with no so and what we decided also which is a new thing they never did before is to divide the chapels in two because mostly the people that grieve with the body are there with the body for five minutes maybe and the rest is talking to people it's more social so we decided to divide the space to give to allow this because in all the funerals that they owe and that they are in mexico what happens is that the people going to the chapel are for five minutes and then go out and be in the halls with everybody else because they don't want to start talking or else uh, doing this social uh, meeting thing in where the body is. So we divide the chapels in two. You can see them, each chapel has two spaces and they have a private garden also in order to allow people if they wanted to escape to the garden and just go leave to do that, no? So this is the hall that I'm talking about and uh, as I was telling you this is like the connection between the exterior and the interior and between uh, the different chapels and um, a little bit on the construction what we we needed of course a material again that could allow us to do uh, what we wanted uh, achieve what we wanted and we decided concrete was the only thing that we would be able to achieve this, that we would be able to achieve this. Of course, on the other hand, concrete was very, very difficult to handle with a guy that was never building in his life before, exposed concrete even more. So what we decided is to work with a concrete that had a, a, a pigment. Uh, the pigment comes from the natural, um, and the color comes from the natural stones that are around the area. It's like this, it's pink. And, uh, and we decided to use it like that in order not to have these too many problems with the gray concrete that would look totally like different and, and mainly raw uh, at the end. And we all also um, decided to use a texture because in this way we could uh, deal with uh, the unevenness of the pouring of the concrete and at the vibration of the concrete because we knew it was not going to be perfect. And uh, in this way, you can see that the final, uh, final concrete work is not very, very soft or very nice. Actually, it's very rough. But uh, the, our strategies went to that direction. We always knew that was going to happen. And uh, the unevenness, it's, uh, well, I think at the end it's okay because uh, it's pink and if it would have been gray it would have looked especially in a funeral house a little bit too much a little bit too too heavy uh, to handle and uh, this is the interior of the chapel in the in the um, uh, pathway you go from the social area to the chapel we wanted to create this path so you don't go exactly directly and you go into a transition space again that allows you to think that you're going into seeing the body of your loved one or allows you to also get rid of that thinking and go out to the social, more social area, no? This is a cafeteria. Photograph is when it was just finished, so this way it looks empty. This is one of the gardens and this is the different gardens we created around the chapels that all have like different types of vegetation according to where they were in the garden. The garden was existing. Another image of the of the hall, the entrance. Uh, as you can see, the most social space in the in the starting of the in the in the beginning of the chapels, and then you enter to the other space. The next project that I'm going to present, I'm going to focus a little bit more on. I'm going to do it quick because I know it's already 
uh, uh, time passed. Um, but it's a botanical garden that you were talking about, Nico, in the, in the, present, in the, pres in the presentation you did. And um, it's a, a botanical garden we did in the north of Mexico. This is Mexico. Mexico City is uh, where the rot red big thing is. Um, the state is in the state of, of Sinaloa, and the dot that it's in the middle is the capital of the state, which is Culiacán. This state, uh, this is Culiacán, the city, which uh, in general I would say is a very common city or a very usual city. You would find cities like this all over Mexico. Cities are very spread out, only two floor heights, more or less. Um, not not very well planned, not planned at all, not, not, not very well, not planned at all, not thought, grown uh, organically. And the only thing I think this city has a, as a difference from the other cities in Mexico is that it has a, a river that divides in two and then in three, which it doesn't happen. I mean, um, we don't have navigable rivers in Mexico at all, in the whole Mexico. We have very few rivers in Mexico that are big, and we have very few cities that are sitting next to the rivers, of course, because of the same reason. So this doesn't happen there. And uh, still, till now, in Culiacán, they don't use it as an asset. They, don't, they cannot use it as, a, as an economic income because, as I was telling you, it's not navigable. So this makes a little constraint. But they don't use it as an asset for the city until now. We, we're working on that, we're pushing. <laughs> um, so you would say it's an average city, except that it's sitting, uh, it's the capital of one of the most important states in, this, in the country. It's the state that produces most of the food we eat in the whole country. It, it, agriculturally speaking, it's very important. It is, uh, I think it exports 40% of the tomatoes that are consumed in the US. So it's a very important agriculture state. And uh, for its strategic position between uh, the south uh, part of the country and South America and the United States and its agriculture um, uh, culture, it became also the state that produces the most uh, um, drugs. So it, it produces the good agriculture and the bad agriculture. Uh, drug dealers, drug cartels uh, started in this state. Uh, nowadays this is one of the most safe states in the whole country because of that. Because the most powerful drug dealers in the country live there. So they want to keep their, their state safe. And uh, it's also one of the most rich states because of the ag good agriculture, but also because of the bad agriculture. So it's a uh, rather high income state uh, and not normal for the rest of the country. And that makes a, a very unique uh, uh, place, Culiacán. This culture of uh, new money has, and, and drug dealer has really impacted in every other part of the culture, architecture, of course. Uh, we call it narco, neo-narco style. Yeah, this is uh, like a popular name. Uh, this is a cemetery, for example, for the drug dealers. And this, uh, this is the things you can see in the city. It also has impacted the music, the, um, the arts, the, mainly the, the, the popular arts in the city, uh, the fashion, definitely, uh, the way they live, the urbanism, everything, no? So uh, even the religion, this is a very religious state, Catholic, mainly all of them are Catholic, but they have a religion, the, the drug dealers have a religion and they venerate a saint that it's called Jesus Malverde, and this is the chapel for this guy. And this guy has created, this is a saint for them, has created a whole culture around that goes around the saint, as I was telling you, that goes in fashion, goes in music, and goes in the drug, drugs as well. No? So this is a state um, where the Botanical Garden is, the project. Uh, when they first called me the, to, to, to intervene in this garden that was existing, the idea was um, it is uh, one of the most important businessmen from this city. He has a retail company that it's uh, transnational. He's one of the richest guys in Mexico. Uh, and he decided he wanted to change 
the face of his city. He wanted to change the, how the world sees his city, how Mexico sees his city, and not only uh, put it, position it as the city of the drug dealers, but position it as a city where culture happens. He has a very important uh, contemporary art collection and uh, he loves plants. So he became the president of the pa board of uh, patrons of this garden and he decided to hire a curator to um, uh, start uh, uh, a collection for the garden. Uh, he wanted first that the collector chose pieces from his collection to put them in the garden and the, the curator convinced him to not put pieces of his collection, but to commission artists from his collection to uh, do site-specific pieces. Uh, his collection is very is huge, is very broad, is uh, contemporary art, uh, international contemporary art from all over the world. So uh, a list of 40 artists uh, were put together. Every other artist went to the garden and chose a place or chose an idea to be done. Artists, the list includes artists such as Dan Graham, Simon Starling, Tino Segal, and Rizala, Rikri Tiravanija, the, I think the most renowned artists, uh, contemporary artists, not, they were not chosen because of that, they were chosen because of their work and their representation in the collection of this guy. And um, artists from Mexico like Gabriel Orozco or Pedro Reyes or artists that are also very well known internationally. And then we were uh, invited because they thought the project was becoming more, more ambitious than what they thought and they thought they needed an architect. And they brought me there and um, my first sense was, uh, well, I was never in a botanical garden before, I must admit it. I was, ashamed to, to notice that when I was flying there. I knew nothing about botanics, really. Well, of course, I knew what was a pine and what was a cactus, but barely almost like that. And, um, but I knew a lot of cont contemporary art. I liked it a lot. I was already working with Gabriel Orozco, so in that field I was comfortable enough. So I arrived to the botanical garden and I was afraid what I'm, what I'm going to, I was, the, the, my office was starting, so obviously this project was uh, a very incredible uh, opportunity for me. So I really wanted to do the project. So my first feeling was what I'm going to do in this botanical garden, I'm gonna feel really stupid going inside there. I'm not gonna understand anything. And how I'm going to do a project like that, no? So I entered the garden and the garden welcomed me very, very well. It, it uh, showed me a lot of things. It educated me in four hours, incredibly. And it was done very intuitively. So I thought this had to be the main driven of the, of the project. In, in this city, and many cities in Mexico, art is not part of the culture. Uh, popular art is, traditional arts and crafts is, but art, as we all probably know it and we could discuss about it, is not even introduced in the city. There's one museum that was built by this same guy, uh, it's uh, also a public uh, building, probably it's from, for the government, but it was donated by this guy, which was running for five years, empty, totally, with no collection, with no program, of course, because it's, it's very difficult to get the funds there, and with no people. No? The only people that were there in the exhibitions was the people that Agustin, this guy, the, the, the businessman, made them go, make special tours for people to go and start doing a program in the schools. People is really not in contact with art at all, not in any type of uh, way. Uh, so um, for me, it was really important Bec and the same feeling that I had entering the botanical garden is the same feeling people have in Mexico all over uh, when they are faced to a museum. They really don't enter, they don't even enter, I mean I had to enter to the botanical garden because I wanted to do the project. People don't enter to a museum because they think they're, they're going to feel ignorance, it's nothing for them, there's nothing to do for them in that, in that building, no? So, um, it, it, for me it was really important that the people could relate to the art the same way I was relating to the, to the botanics. That the people could really feel that this, in, instead of overwhelming them, 
could show them. No? So I thought the best idea was to try to uh, find um, uh, a grid. I would say agreed, but I would say an organization, better an organization pattern that could help put everything together, that could help and could allow the garden to, to still coexist the same way. It was chaotic and it was very, done very intuitively with the introduction of the art, so people could feel as, um, as the same uh, entering to this space that, that we enter every day. They use this garden a lot. It's a, it's a very important place for the city. And what we did is we found um, uh, a solution in the same trees of the garden, and we traced the branches of the tree. And what we did is we overlapped these traces to the existing garden, and we, of course, um, had to uh, adapt them to what existed and what was needed. And at the end, we created a master plan that would look like that. This is a master plan we did in 2005 when we started the project. Um, right now, it's a little bit different, but it's the same system that it's working through all the time. No? So this system allowed us to understand where we could uh, introduce the new buildings, how we could introduce the new buildings, how we could uh, relate to the art, how we could make the artists understand the way through the garden and uh, how to intervene in the garden. And, uh, and uh, we also uh, thought that the most important idea was to keep the idea that this is a botanical garden, no? That it always feels that it is a botanical garden that has art and not an art uh, display thing that has beautiful plants around, no? So uh, we work with, we decided to convince the client to invite uh, um, uh, the specialist in botanics. So what they did is they classified all the plants existing in the, in, the, in the garden and we work with them in order to start to think of the system that could really uh, be logical to what it existed. No? So um, we, and we work with the, them also with the, for the landscape and um, we, uh, we work through, uh, through the project like that. One of the most uh, as I was telling you in the beginning, uh, what I like is to collaborate a lot. And I do believe, strongly believe that architecture nowadays is not uh, uh, anymore a work of one man as a genius man, working to solve everything uh, with a team of, of people that can draw things for him. I think right now architecture is more a collaborative job that needs many disciplines to, uh, in, in the same level to work with. To in order to respond as in, in an intelligent way. No? I, I truly believe on that and I believed it since the day I started my office. And this project was like that, was set it up in the table for me like that. I, ne I didn't have to convince anyone. I had to collaborate with all the people that were already in the table. So, so it was really nice. And the other thing I think is very important of this project is that the, the garden is public. The space is uh, owned by the government and uh, it's for free, it's open for free, and that all the investment is done by a private guy. This doesn't happen in Mexico. In the US, for example, it's very common that uh, public spaces and uh, cultural institutions, uh, research institutions are founded by private in entities. In Mexico, this doesn't happen. I don't know how is the system in Germany, but uh, in Mexico, people is expecting that the government invests on every public space. And this never happens because, of course, we have so many necessities before that public space, I think, is the last thing that they, the government is thinking. So it's very good that we have now uh, uh, people like this guy investing in public space uh, for public. No? So I think it uh, also was one of the things that it attracted me a lot. So we did uh, this, um, this uh, intervention. Uh, it, uh, doing very strategic interventions like such as moving the bamboos to one area and creating the bamboo area in order to achieve a better environment and a, very, a very better ecosystem. But well, I can, I can stop uh, talking uh, for hours in this project. We've been working almost for eight years on it, so I will not go on that. As I was telling you, it's a public space that is very used. 
Uh, it's uh, used in a daily basis. The people go there for exercise. People go there for uh, meetings. For the schools go there a lot. And so we wanted really to just uh, make a ground that could enhance that and not to obviously not to kill nothing of that no so we created um, uh, we introduced of course different strategies of landscaping that could feel also kind of so uh, continuing the intuitiveness the project had in the beginning but definitely defining uh, yeah, parts of the collection and enhancing the collection to bring the collection up to the level of the art. No? But as I was telling you, what I think the most important thing that happened in this project that we never thought in the beginning, well, I always thought that the art needed to be introduced the same way the, the, the botanic was introduced. But what, what has happened is really amazing. No? Really, people is getting uh, involved with art in many different ways. Probably the artists have never imagined that they were going to have this response. This, well, probably these artists, yes, because this is what they, uh, they did. This, is, this artist is Aloran Calzadilla, which is this American art, very important American artist that were the, not this Biennale, the past Biennale, the United States Pavilion representatives. And uh, this artist, this of course, this piece is very easy to relate on, like in these grounds, in a daily basis. Uh, but I think that not all of it is. For example, Dan Graham's pavilion, which um, you all probably know the work of Dan Graham. It's very hard to photograph, obviously, because he works with perspective and the material and the glass and the and the, the space. But uh, what is happening in this in this is really like it's been the frame for the most important days of the lives of the people in the city, which uh, for me it's really something that it's very very important to happen with with the art. No, this would never ever have happened if we would put exactly the same pieces in this museum that it's ten blocks away. Never, uh, especially because when when art is in a, in a space like this, constraints are much larger, but, but also the approach of the people is different. Not even like the guards are there and don't touch that, but is that the people doesn't behave the same way. No? So I think this has been very, very rewarding on how the people is starting to relate to art, even to get involved in the, into art. And I'm going to explain you why. This is a piece of Francis Alice which um, he's a Belgium-born Belgium artist, but lives in Mexico City, um, between Mexico and London, but mainly Mexico. And uh, he decided to give death to his beetle in, in the garden. Of course, imagine the first thoughts of the people were like, this drunk guy from Mexico City, because he has a plate from Mexico, how, how did they allow him to enter the, our garden, crash his car into one of our our trees and leave them there. I mean, imagine these people thinking, of course, exactly on this. No, I even, I even heard some comments like that. And then when uh, when this is explained and, and it, it said what it is, people become uh, more personal and have, have more opinions. In this case, all people were laughing and it's okay and they're relating good to it. This is a piece from Olafur Eliasson, uh, which is a pavilion that. Uh, that enhances like the changes of the season, which in Culiacán they're not. You don't feel them. It's always hot. It's one season, hot, 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 during the whole year. And uh, but but it definitely has the different uh, slight changes of the season. So this pavilion shows it because it has plants that, uh, of course, in the different seasons work differently. Sometimes they have flowers, sometimes they're only green, and sometimes they're empty and they allow a, sh uh, a direct shadow to happen. No? Uh, or this uh, pavilion, that is, this is the only artist that never went to the garden, is Richard Long. Uh, but this uh, piece existed in a, in a plaza in New York City. Everybody, of course, respected as a work of art, as an incredible work of art. It was there, sitting there uh, by itself with a little um, uh, sign saying the artist, Richard Long, etc., and the title. And of course, we put it in the garden and it became the picnic space, the space for um, uh, they do shootings, uh, different shootings of 
private things, but also public things. And obviously, this never happened in New York, even though it was in a public space, because people understand art very differently. No? And I think this is very, very nice. Um, this is a piece that most polemic cost and most uh, people were uh, involved with. This is a uh, benches done by a local artist named Teresa Margolles. Uh, and she um, did these benches, very comfortable benches in a beautiful place. Uh, but these benches are done with the water that was used to wash dead uh, people that were killed in the, um, in the drug dealer problem. No? So the, they first introduced the benches. Uh, they never said that they were done with this water, and it was actually done. Literally, I was there when it was done. It was kind of shocking. But uh, they, uh, well, we never said that they were done like this. And um, then the, but the, the artists said always that they, have a, they should have a sign. But the sign was not there because we couldn't fix, blah, blah, many things. So it, for a year, they had no sign. And especially these women were always sitting in there after running. And uh, when they put the sign, the sign said that these benches were done with the water that was used to wash people uh, assassinated by the drug dealers. They started a campaign to take out the, the, the benches of the garden. They thought they were really uh, um, disrespectful. And it was really disrespectful for, the, for them also that we never said that and that they used it so long. And the idea of the artist was, of course, that the, all the people is sitting in the problem and not doing anything. And it actually started a discussion, in the, even in the newspapers it went, national newspapers, about it. So, as I was telling you, this is uh, the first uh, how society is getting involved in art, and it's amazing how art is also getting involved in the society. No, this would never ever had happened in the museum, never. And these things are the most important things I think this project has done. And for us, it's really like a luxury to be working on it. No, uh, different uh, other pieces. Uh, Atelier Van Lies out. They did the. Um, all the fountains to drink water, Valesca Suarez. Uh, they're also now the scenario for these, um, these girls turn 15 years old, and in Mexico when you turn 15 years old, it's a very important moment for a girl. They do a big party and they wear these dresses like princes, and they go and take pictures of that day there in the garden nowadays, no? So it's really very important very important moment in their lives and they will keep these photographs forever and this is the frame for it. Uh, so this is how important the garden has become and this is how they start to relating also to the art pieces and, and of course we are allowing everything. Uh, this is a piece from Julian Oppi, Gabriel Orozco, Sofia Tabas, etc. There are 40 pieces, 19, 20 have been built. Simon Starling is there. Uh, Tino is there, but it, it yet cannot be photographed. Tino Segal, as you know, cannot be photographed. It's there. It's a beautiful piece where um, there's a singer that sings you whenever you pass in front of her. Uh, so she's singing all day long, and she stops when you pass through. She starts when he, she sees you, and she stops when you pass through. And it's beautiful because it's uh, a way of accompanying your trip to the garden, in a way. No? Uh, what we did in the garden is uh, we did a series of six, 16 little pavilions, and our strategy was to divide as much as possible the program, as in the house I showed you before, but to truly divide it in, um, uh, and to create uh, spaces that could uh, impact less in terms of size in, the, in one site in the building but also that could also tell you all the time that you are in a botanical garden and you are not just anywhere. Uh, for example, they asked us for a small auditorium in the beginning to start to give a seven minute introduction for, for, the, for, the, for the garden. And we decided to do an open auditorium. This was a whole controversy in the beginning, but I'm not gonna go through the whole story. And uh, we created a building that could give shadow to you, to your seat, 
but while you're sitting there for seven minutes, but also would allow you to always remind, remind you that you are in the botanical garden. You hear all the noises, you hear, uh, you, you see all the, the shadow changes, well in seven minutes it's not much, but you are always reminded that you are in the botanical garden. And we did this strategy for every other building in the, in the garden that we designed. Not all of them are built, uh, only four, four structures are built out of 16. We're starting to build six more. Uh, yes, yesterday they started, and um, and uh, so, but they are all designed within the same way. Of course, as you can see, the geometry it uh, comes from the from the um, from the master plan and from the definition we said uh, the the whole project needed to have. And of course, it was designed in 2005. The house of Gabriel was 2000. Uh, seven. So this is pre Gabriel. So and you can see it. No, definitely. Our strategy of intervention for the new buildings they have asked us after the first buildings we designed, which were these ones, is very different. I don't. Unfortunately, I don't have an image. Sorry. But uh, this is. Uh, 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 we decided to keep the same idea on dividing the program. So this building is the exhibition room. The center building is a um, um, uh, workshop for ceramics, and this building is the library. You can see this, the workshop for ceramics and the library from the north facade here. And uh, these three set of buildings are the educational facilities. Uh, the educational facilities have an educational room for kids, an auditorium, and, um, and a service area. And um, as, as I told you, we also reduce like the program onto the minimum. So if you go into the auditorium and you need to go to the toilets, you need to go out the auditorium, uh, out to the garden, and go into the building, uh, into the building of the bathrooms. And uh, this way, as I was telling you, if you're watching a movie, you're in a workshop or doing um, or listening to a lecture in this auditorium, you need to be aware that you are in the garden all the time, no? Um, some uh, artists also related to the architecture. In, this is the case of these bumps you see before the buildings. Um, this is an artist from uh, Mexico, a group of artists from Mexico, Tercer Un Quinto, and what they did is they buried the ruins of the little hut that there was there for educational facility they had before. And they kept the ruins and they, uh, they um, buried them there. Um, as a gesture of, of burying the, the, the building that was there. No? Uh, also creates like a, um, a, a playground for the kids. These buildings are mainly for, for the kids. Technically speaking, uh, in this case, we were very lucky to, t to have the best contractors we could have. So the concrete in this case is really done impressively. The details are amazing. Our idea was always uh, to create the, the structures and the size allow us to create a structure that only was built by the floor slab, the, the walls and the, the roof slab. So it's only a shell. It has no structure in the middle. So what we wanted is to uh, use also at the same surface for it. So we use concrete, of course. This was the only material that could allow us to do that, and um, poured on site concrete. And uh, the shell is 30 centimeters wide. So the slab, the floor, the the walls, and the and the roof are 30 centimeters, and it has no structure in the middle. And we uh, always thought uh, my my first approach was that I wanted to present the idea to the client that we needed to do a master plan, that we needed to invite these people from botanics, the specialists of botanics, and that I didn't care if the, if the buildings were done very roughly, uh, because that was not the main thing. As I was telling you, uh, we thought of the strengthness of the, of the space, 
And the response was, yeah, everything is great, but we need to hire the best person that can do uh, concrete in, in Mexico. And it was like, oh, okay, where do I sign? <laughs> Even better, no? So, and it was really like that. The, the concrete work is amazing. Um, as you can see here, the, the shell is what it creates the structure. The structure you see in the middle holds the middle floor that holds the room for the teachers. Here you can see it doesn't arrive to the to the roof, it's only uh, holding this slab. And um, this is the educational facility that uh, this was the first picture. This is how it's nowadays uh, being used. There's also a piece by Rivan and Nieves van der, another Brazilian artist there uh, that interacts with kids. This is the service facilities and this is the entrance to the auditorium uh, and more images of the auditorium and the rest of the buildings. I think that I'm not going to go through the route, pilgrimage route because otherwise it's going to be too late and I'd rather open it to questions. But I'm going to leave a, a video of the pilgrimage route which is a project I explained very quickly. We, we did a master plan for this pilgrimage route of uh, 154 kilometers. It's a Catholic pilgrimage route. Um, and we thought it was important to invite different architects and artists from different parts of the world to have a different vision, to each do a different, uh, very special and very small and simple structure uh, that could um, make a viewing point or a reference point along the route. We also did some infrastructure like shelters and points for people to go to the toilet and and trash containers and emergency service areas. And this is a, a route which is in Jalisco, the state of Sinaloa is north of Jalisco. Jalisco is a state uh, in the center of the country. It has uh, the red dot, the red dark dot there, well, this is Mexico City, and on the left is the lake where the house of compacted area is. And the little line, sorry, you can see a little on the north of the state uh, that goes is the, the pilgrimage route. So I'm going to leave the video on and then I'm going to open uh, for uh, a little discussion if you want. Um, it's a video on the pilgrimage route so you can see some of the structure we did. Thank you very much. So no questions? I was that clear? <laughs> or it was not interesting at all? <laughs> Both could happen. It was really interesting uh, to see your presentation about how, how different the uh, condition of the basic web in Europe was designed. Uh, it's really interesting in how uh, you could engage the client with the understanding of a study that you already um, achieved. I mean, in your design exploration with uh, this uh, really different kind of uh, uh, social condition that has different level of understanding and aesthetic? It's a very good question. And um, I think the, the, the good luck uh, the good part is I, that I was in the correct moment, that in the correct place at the correct moment, because the thing is that even they probably don't understand this uh, new idea of this different aesthetics, they're willing to, to go for it because it's new and it's different. And mainly this is the, how the clients approach and want uh, to, to work with me. And uh, some of them, in the case of the botanical garden, for example, of course, the, the client is very, very well educated and, and has a very important art, art collection, so you could understand that he definitely wants to have this uh, uh, architecture be built no? and promotes a lot uh, this, my work, actually, he is uh, one of the big promoters. And uh, so I have on one side these clients that are very, very well educated. On the other hand, clients like, for example, the, 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 um, the lady of the compacted earth house, she really understood nothing about contemporary architecture, but she was willing to, to know it, you know, and she was willing to experiment with it. And this is a part of living in this, in this country in this moment, that this, there's people 
that is willing to uh, to to go for it just to understand it you know they're willing to go into it and to understand it which is the case of this this the lady for the for the uh, competitor house so this is how this client for example in the government the government is even harder um, uh, he is also an art collector and became a minister of tourism for the state and this is why he decided to hire me as an architect for this pilgrimage route he understood uh, uh, the importance of this aesthetic proposal that we we have in our office, no? So, yeah, it's a, a little bit of these two sides, mainly our clients. Because I think uh, the most is that the dispersive is definitely uh, something that has to be means money for them. And that's where this problem has come from. You know, like how, how to realize the building. Yes, well, we... we um, I think in this case, we, this is why we are developing this sensibility to, on how to, to deal with this. It, there's always an economical restraint. I think even here, you always have an economical restraint. It's just the, the, the bar is higher, no? But, uh, but I think it's especially sensible in a country like ours, no? So I think especially we need to make we need to make ourselves really sensible to that matter in order to achieve what we wanted. If we propose structures that would be uh, more difficult to achieve, technically speaking, probably we could meet, it's hard, but the, the budget, but technically speaking more complicated, it would be more difficult to communicate with the clients that especially don't understand these things. No? It would be even more difficult. If it's all also a little bit of a restraint, it would be more difficult. Yes? Are the, the, the second question you show about this condensed earth material? What is that? Compacted earth? Yeah, how do you do that? It's the most simple material on earth. <laughs> it's earth, literally earth, with water. And it's compacted to achieve the strength. Uh, in our case, we added co uh, cement uh, in order to um, have a more rigid structure to have the spams we wanted. But you could build it literally with only earth and water uh, as you build the bricks. Like normally, what is most used is the bricks, no? Adobe. It's adobe. Okay. And, uh, and then what we, it's because it's called like that, the technique is, they use frames like in concrete, these, well, or molds. These molds are uh, steel because the compactation makes uh, that the molds are needed to be very, very, have very good strength because the compactation is what the importance of the final strength of it. So in order for us to achieve the, the, the spams with the size of the walls we needed, which is uh, more or less 55 centimeters width, uh, we needed to add 8% of cement. Uh, and this also allows us that the, the earth could be exposed and it doesn't uh, run out, no? So it's easy for maintenance in the house, especially for cleaning, no? Uh, works in. You can realize the open corner as well. Sorry? You can realize the, the, the open corner as well. Yes. Without, without any windows. Nothing. Nothing. The, the compression of the material makes the strength. Of course, uh, the spam needs to be calculated, no? In order, like, like any other material. But yes, it, it really has nothing inside. Nothing. No, it doesn't have a mesh or anything, uh, steel or anything. Uh, yes, uh, it depends on the humidity that the earth has, but you can, um, you can find the earth to achieve it. It's not so difficult. Eh? So you, I think you can build it here as well with no problem. The roof is concrete, and we decided to use concrete because it was the cheapest material we could use to have the span and everything. 
So in Mexico, we cannot build with uh, very much with wood. We don't have wood that works for construction because we don't have um, uh, the wood that we have is not useful, and we don't have many how to say farms or plantations of wood. So the wood we could use is very cheap and very and not good for construction. And the one you could use for construction uh, or for the buildings, it's very expensive. So wood is not an option. So we couldn't uh, do a wood roof, for example. Uh, you could do compacted air roofs, but in smaller spans, not in that big. So this is why we decided to do it in concrete. But it sits on top of the structure like that. We just uh, leave, left some uh, of the uh, steel um, things that are in the middle of the slave of the roof to go in the earth. That's it. That's how it, 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 it works. No, I see myself as an architect nowadays. I really think that architecture needs to be more like this, more collaborative. I think architecture needs more, more, more minds than one just to, to solve the problems and the complexities that society has and to offer really a, real architecture. So no, I see myself as an architect nowadays. <laughs> Well, that's a difficult question to answer. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no. Um, no, 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 I do know. Uh, well, I think that uh, composition is a big thing and the understanding of, uh, of the main issue of the, of the, of the, of the thing you want to communicate. No? I think if you understand really the, the core of it, as I was telling you, for example, in the Ajijic house, in the compacted earth house, the main issue was to, to meet the, the, not only the budget, but the conditions the client put us, which one was the budget, and the other was to achieve the spaces she wanted with the budget. You know? So trying to analyze and to solve that puts our attention on designing a space that is like that. And of course, it has no, no, no definitions of details because that's the last thing in your priority list. So really being able to define this first thing, I think it's, at least to us, gives us the tool to understand how to design and who achieved the, the design, no? So I think we spend a lot of time also with the students understanding this. What are the main situations that we're gonna address and how are we going to address them? No? How, what is the strategy behind? And, and yeah, this is how we're working with the students all over with different types of projects, trying to understand like the main ideas that are driving us and to build our architecture um, from the idea, no? instead of from the geometry or instead of from the program, developing from the idea. And from then, then it all, all comes, of course, it comes the geometry, it comes the, the program, etc. But it, it always has the idea behind. I think that's how well, we do. I was, uh, I was you have um, your background as an uh, advisor to the city of Mexico, authorities, and also in various statements you expressed. Uh, keen interest in the city. And then, um, and here you show us, really, I suppose indirectly, 
my question sort of begins to be touched upon in the, in the botanical garden and the way that you discuss it. The question is very simple. Could you just expand a little bit on how you see the relationship between architecture as the design of a building or an object, the relationship between that and current issues in urban issues in Mexico? That's a very interesting question, um, and I didn't address that topic, but one of the main um, uh, research fields in the office is trying to address what we could do with our architecture uh, to impact the, the really impact uh, in Mexico, no? And um, uh, to give a background, in Mexico the production of space the public production of space is very organic, done by privates. It's, uh, nothing is planned. Urbanism is responsive. Instead of, I mean, it's contradictory because the word urbanism is planning. And it's not planned, it's responding. In Mexico, it's responding to what the people have done. So the people mainly are some in just invading some starting to live and work with the place where they sit and uh, and then the government arrives and then the infrastructure arrives, and then the architects arrive no but afterwards and uh, and what we are trying to first what we did uh, in the beginning of um, of the office is we set up a, a research program that trying to understand how this was produced, no? which is very difficult, this is ununderstandable. But uh, trying to, to, to understand how the conditions uh, are in the ground. And what we're doing now is uh, we think that uh, one of the issues that people is not, uh, or architects are not involved yet because it was, architects were involved and then it was left mainly to the developers, it is social housing. So I, uh, nowadays we think that um, because social housing is also producing, how it's developed now is producing the public space and it's producing how the city grows, it's also producing how urbanism is going in Mexico um, because it's a big story and I could go for two hours on that topic or even more. But um, the developers uh, develop uh, projects of 15,000 houses at once or more. Uh, so this really driven the way the city goes, especially the small cities, no? So there, there, there are times where even the, these, these developments, new developments that have uh, 25,000 houses at once are larger than the, 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 the city where they were built. So they really impact in every other sense. So now we're working in, um, uh, I think, it, what it could be our most important work. And if we do it, it would really leave me almost like we're done. <laughs> uh, it's uh, developing with the government um, a new politics for, uh, or a new strategy to develop social housing, which would be a new policy at the end, not a design of a house, not a design of a urban development, but a, a design of, pol of policies that would uh, um, constrain or restrain or, or give a direction to the new uh, way of developers to do houses. And this, we believe, it's the start of the new um, production of space, because I first started thinking, and this is why I started working in the social uh, and urban development department, uh, that the, the solution would be to have urban development plans. But it's really difficult. I mean, that would be a great solution. But it's really difficult for many, 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 many reasons um, that I would also take two hours to explain, mainly because uh, it doesn't exist the way of thinking in the people in the government of, for planning. So introducing a new policy for uh, house social development would mean really to introduce planning uh, in an underground way. 
And I, I now realize that I think it, that's the way. And I now see, uh, fortunately, a lot of architects into the discussion table of this. And I think we could r really make this go into a good direction. Um, there's also a thing that, uh, like architects were a part of this discussion because as I was saying, it was left to the developers. It was the easy route, but it was also like the, the economical way of, of policy that the government did that drove this to that point. And nowadays also the government realized that this was the wrong way because it's costing them much more money because of all the social problems and the sanitary problems that all these new housing units have created in the society. And uh, this is why now the, the government is worried. And now it's like the architects are pushing and probably we're being listened. This is in the initial stages. In the initial stages. This is, the new government is the one that is really listening. It started in January. We started working with the government in September when they were already elected. They knew they, they needed to do something different. And It's very general, but it's the, the way it works in Mexico. It's very general it's, and it's very federal. This will be a policy for the whole country because this is how it works in Mexico. Because it's very federal, the, how the politics work in Mexico, how everything works. Other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you.